Uh, welcome to our fourth and final Zoom lecture of 2020. Uh, uh -huh. We're very excited that we've, we've been able to continue this way. Um, and it's so nice to see your faces. I am really looking forward to, uh, to Andrea's talk about this fantastic embroidered overmantle today. I, I have to say, I did not know that term before Andrea brought it to us, but I'm sure that's just one of the many things I'm gonna learn about this piece before our time is up today. And uh, Andrea will take questions after her talk, so we'll unmute you at the end of the lecture. But meanwhile, if you want to put a question in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, we'll look at those as well. Um, so either way, and I, I just wanna let you know that eventually our lectures do appear on our website under the events tab. So if you know somebody who signed on today or who couldn't make it um, today, uh, let them know. It won't be right away, but we will have it up eventually. Um, I also wanna remind everybody about our regular lecture series, which starts on January 10th uh, with Salem historian, Jim McAllister. And I think we it's likely that all of our winter lectures will be delivered by Zoom. So tell your friends and family, no matter where they are and watch your mailbox for an electronic announcement in a few weeks about that. But to the business of today, I want to introduce to you Dr. Andrea Pappas, who came to the Pickering House. Oh Lord, how long ago was that now? <laughs> I think it's been about four years for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, and it wanted to have a look at this piece that I said, sure, I knew it was important just because of the size of it, if nothing else. But uh, I had no idea the, what, what really going on there. And so I'm excited to share that with you. Um, Andrea earned her PhD in art history from the University of Southern California and is now chair of the Department of Art and Art History at Santa Clara University. Her current book project, which is called Embroidering the Landscape, Art, Women and the Environment in British North America, 1740 to 1770, examines embroidery from an environmental history and eco-critical perspective. Um, her work has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Long-Term Fellowship at Oh. Just to finish that up, a long-term fellowship <laughs> winter tour. Um, and now I'll shut up and Andrea, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that really wonderful introduction. Um, can you guys see my slides? Okay, okay, great. Um, and I believe you probably have a little tiny picture of me in the corner of your screens. And if I have any trouble with my video, I'm gonna end up turning, turning that off just to improve the things. So first of all, I um, wanna thank Linda Jenkins for inviting me to be here today. And also Carolyn McGuire for her assistance with the technology. Um, and to also express a, my thanks to the Pickering Foundation for helping me with this research. Um, as Linda mentioned, this is part of a book project and it comes out of the last chapter, uh, which I'm completing now. Um, the book looks at landscape embroideries in terms of real landscapes, primarily from an environmental history perspective. And today I'm gonna to start with a quick introduction as to how these large embroideries were made. Um, So sorry, um, the rest of the talk is in three parts. Um, in part one, I'm gonna take a deep dive into Mary Pickering's butterflies and the broad interest in natural science at the time. Uh, part two looks at her apple tree situating it relative to orchard practice of the period. And part three briefly looks at her flock of blackbirds. So uh, here she is. Well, here's her work. So sometime around 1750, uh, Mary Pickering and her dates are 1733 to 1805, finished her embroidered landscape picture sometimes measuring more than four feet wide, always brightly colored and elaborately framed, embroidered pictures rivaled paintings in both cost and cultural significance. Their pervasiveness in the households of wealthy Americans made them a prominent feature in colonial visual culture. Large embroidered pictures with this wide format hung over the mantle in the most important rooms of the house, so hence they're called overmantles. I know that not everybody is familiar with this type of artwork, so a little bit of background uh, is in order as to how these embroideries came to be made. In the 18th century, every girl learned basic sewing. It was not uncommon to start this instruction as early as five years old. Most girls learned basic embroidery 
enough to mark linen so they could be sent out for laundering. However, young women from elite and well-to-do families received further instruction in decorative embroidery in schools, and these were day schools or boarding schools. The first project was typically a sampler uh, with more elaborate projects undertaken later in the finishing schools. This last leg in a women's education could include a large overmantle like Mary's, or women might choose to study drawing, music, or some other refined accomplishment. After years of formal training, for those who did choose embroidery, women in their late teens and early 20s stitched these overmantles in wool and silk, usually while at finishing schools. These large works represented a significant investment. A year at a boarding school in Boston, which included embroidery instruction, could cost as much as uh, sending a son to a year at Harvard. When a woman married, her large embroidery stayed with her father's family rather than going with her to her new home. And this is why the Pickering daughters uh, embroideries are still all together in Pickering house. So in summary, while every woman learned to sew, only women from the elite sectors of colonial society produced large embroidered pictures in British North America. And these were indeed originally very brightly colored. And so I'm showing you the back now, this photo came from the recent conference conservation uh, treatment of this overmantle. And as you can see, the colors were quite vivid. This is certainly, almost certainly what all embroidery from this period looked like originally. And being able to see this bright color turned out to be a key turning point in my research about this overmantle. So I'm very grateful to the, for the generosity of the uh, Pickering Foundation and the people who funded the recent conservation of this um, textile. And I do see there is a quick question in the chat. And yes, she did all the work on this, as far as we know. These pictures date from about 1740 to 1770, which was a time of great environmental and epistemological change. The 18th century produced changes in farming methods, an acceleration in the worldwide trade in plant specimens, and extensive irreversible alterations to global ecosystems and the landscape, including throughout British North America. In this era, land ownership and its improvement drove rapidly expanding colonial enterprises abroad. And it's these changes in the actual environment and in the way that people thought about nature that got me thinking about how women's embroidery might engage these changes. Inspired by these environmental and economic transformations, women made embroidered images that overwhelmingly feature landscapes, yet scholars have never really considered these works in terms of the turbulent history of the actual landscape in this period, let alone what these needleworks might have meant to the women who made them and to their viewers. Mary Pickering's three foot wide overmantle depicts many motifs com commonly found in these works, the apple tree, a seated woman, the mounted hunters, shepherd, shepherdess pear, butterflies, and so forth. To audiences of our time, such repetition often makes these images seem as merely conventions, copies, or types, devoid of documentary information, um, and for that matter, often devoid of creativity. But looking closely at the embroideries reveals that this is not always the case. So let's start in with Mary's blackbirds. Um, they are, I'm sorry, with her butterflies. Well, I had looked at many other species in these textiles, solid identification of specific species or varieties of animals and plants usually relies on knowing what the colors looked like in their own time. And so it's this piece of the research that the conservation made possible. Mary included three butterflies in her embroidery and you see them there in the little white circles. Like other embroiderers, she employed different perspective systems, including hierarchical scale, which enlarges the relative sizes of important objects to the overall image. This in large scale signals that the butterflies had a special significance for pickering. Her butterflies are huge, and you can see that the one next to the shepherdess is nearly large enough to cover her entire bodice. So let's just take them one at a time. The butterfly at upper left bears the small appendages on its hind wings that mark it unambiguously as a swallowtail. A look at the reverse, which you see there on the right, reveals that Pickering employed a yellow-orange thread at the bottom of the hind wings, as well as some blue. Taken together, the overall dark color and combination of blue, orange, and white spots on this butterfly strongly point to a specific species, the spicebush swallowtail. The spicebush swallowtail's habitat extends through eastern North America, including Salem, Massachusetts, where Pickering lived. These butterflies have a wingspan of about three to four inches, so they're about as wide as the palm of your hand. The low flying habit of the spice bush distinguishes it from other species of swallowtails. Spice bush butterflies also tend to flock near ponds, making them easy to observe. And these large butterflies were thus a very striking feature of Mary Pickering's local landscape. 
The butterfly near the seated woman has a strong black outlining on the outer edges of the wings, peppered with white spots. A look at the reverse, again there on the right, shows that the original coloration was originally a bright yellow orange. Again, this points to a specific species, the monarch butterfly. Male monarchs have thinner veins on the wings and less black pigmentation overall than do the females. Pickering carefully included the black spot on the hind wing that distinguishes the male, and so you can see that right here. Like other embroiderers, she only sketchily indicated the delicate black veinings on the wings and left it out altogether on the hind wing. The effect is to emphasize this marker. Pickering also took care to render the stripes on the abdomen of this butterfly. And she notably omitted the side to side line on the hind wings that marks the monarch's smaller mimic, the butterfly, the viceroy butterfly. Both butterflies are common to North America and Salem lies within their range. Like the spice bush, the monarch is a relatively large butterfly with a wingspan of about four inches. Monarchs are noted not just for their spectacular color, but for their fall migration between North America and Mexico, which annually produces clouds of butterflies in the sky. Pickering's local environment, including the large family farm as well as the kitchen garden, had provided ample opportunities to observe these insects. Pickering's third butterfly sports a warm yellow underside, and again, we can see this from looking at the back, and an eye spot on the forewing, and depending, uh, so that's right here, and depending on what your zoom resolution is like, you may or may not be able to see that. The color and markings make this likely a half-size rendering of the orange sulfur butterfly, or its close relative, the clouded sulfur butterfly. Both species feed on alfalfa, clover, and other members of the pea family. These alfalfas and clovers are just some of the imported plant species championed by progressive farmers, which included Pickering's father. These new crops made significant contributions to farm yields as they allowed farmers to stop letting fields lie fallow every fourth year or so. So you can see right off the bat, that's a huge increase in productivity. The Pickerings would regularly have seen these golden yellow butterflies fluttering over the fields seeded with these nitrogen fixing plants. Moreover, these butterflies bear close watching as their caterpillars, if not controlled, become a serious threat to these key crops. Pickering's interest here has two roots. These butterflies are beautiful, but they are also a potentially, they are also potentially damaging to a key component of farm productivity. Thus, it's not surprising that she included them among the species represented in her embroidery. Her overmantle is unusual in its careful depiction of specific species of insects. Other women's embroidered insects generally have somewhat sketchy rendering or are imaginary insects based on butterflies, moths, or wasps. So Pickering's care in rendering these butterflies thus demands an explanation. Notably, these are all native North American species whose ranges do not extend to Europe. This means her rendering of butterflies comes from her observation of nature, close observation as her pains to differentiate her monarch from the viceroy, viceroy I'm sorry, viceroy, and to market sex demonstrate. Moreover, each species of butterfly she depicts has some feature that made it significant in the local environment. The spice bush's unique flying habit, the monarch's migration, and the orange sulfur's potential threat to food security. She cared enough to make the effort to present these butterflies for the informed viewer's inspection, implying the presence of such viewers in the audience for her works. Surely, she counted herself among them. Her embroidered butterflies stake a claim for her place in the discourses of natural science and natural knowledge taking place in her milieu. So now that we know that she's um, observing, if not investigating nature, and that she's representing what she found, how do we connect it to other means of producing and representing natural knowledge? In other words, how can it be seen as part of a history? Pickering's work can be situated along at least two axes. One, transatlantic practices that produce knowledge of nature, and these include botanizing, um, in other words, observing nature, uh, amateur natural science and gardening, among others. And two, we can situate it in a related web of transatlantic visual traditions for picturing knowledge of nature, botanical and entomological illustration, flower painting, landscape painting, and embroidery. Because of time constraints, I'm going to briefly trace only three of these intertwined strands which tie Pickering's renderings of butterflies to natural science, illustration, and gardening. First, in terms of natural science, 
Pickering worked her embroidery in a time when botany and similar investigations, such as entomology, had become a popular pastime for both men and women. Some people thought that women were particularly suited to botanizing in their spare time. Codwallader Colden, Surveyor General of the New York Colony, writing to the Dutch botanist Grenovius in 1775 about his daughter Jane, opens his letter thus, and I'm quoting now, I thought that botany is an amusement which may be made agreeable for the ladies who are often at a loss to fill up their time. Their natural curiosity and the pleasure they take in the beauty and variety of dress seems to fit them for it, end quote. Colden positions women's interest in nature as an extension of their interest in fashion. Their observational skills honed over the tea table as they scrutinize each other's garments and perhaps the latest fashion dolls from London. Cadwallader himself has pursued botany seriously, corresponding with prominent scientists in Europe and publishing a study of the plants near his home. Yet when it came to his daughter Jane, he reduced a serious study of nature to a refined amusement to fill up time. Jane, however, had other ideas. In the four years between 1752 and 1756, she cataloged and illustrated nearly 350 species of plants in her local area, more than half of which her father had missed in his earlier study. Botanists and natural scientists on both sides of the Atlantic knew of her work, and today historians of science, science regard her as America's first woman botanist. Colden's engagement with botany allies less with her father's ideas than it does with those of Eliza Haywood, a prolific and influential author. In 1748, Eliza Haywood, writing in The Female Spectator, described a different benefit accruing from women's study of nature. And I'm quoting now, there is nothing so profitable to the mind than the study of natural philosophy, end quote. Historians of science have found at least nine women in British North America who seriously pursued knowledge of nature in the 18th century. For example, Hannah English Williams collected many specimens of plants and butterflies from her South Carolina plantation between 1701 and 1713. And she sent them to James Pettiver, a natural scientist, apothecary, and member of the Royal Society in London. Eliza Lucas, who ran her family's plantation also in South Carolina, and who pioneered the cultivation of indigo in North America, took a serious interest in the systematic study of plants. And she would have to in order to be able to develop this cultivation. However, we mostly know of these women who are investigating nature only through their appearance in the correspondences between men. Written records with these women may have left have been largely lost. While scholars have looked at the relationship between textiles and the plant trade in terms of imagery, the embroidery tends to drop out of this picture when we start thinking about natural science. This examination of plants and insects was aided by the proliferation of optical equipment in the period, such as microscopes, quizzing glasses, spectacles, and the like. Magnifying glasses proved essential for the examination of the tiny details necessary to the study of botany and small creatures. Indeed, Haywood's fictional correspondent, when Philo Naturae, addresses this explicitly saying, quote, as ladies frequently walk out into the country in little troops, if every one of them would take with her a magnifying glass, what a pretty emulation there would be among them to make fresh discoveries, end quote. Haywood, on the surface, positions women's interest in nature as a delightful competition, but her emphasis on fresh discoveries tells us what is at stake, new knowledge of nature and its workings. Pickering's presentation of these butterflies parallels Haywood's presentation of natural science, seeming to be merely decorative at first glance. But like Haywood's subversive fresh discoveries, Pickering's butterflies represent her engagement with the natural world and the flourishing field of natural science. Second, walks out in the country may have provided opportunities for close observation of nature, but kitchen gardens demanded it. And it's women who largely manage kitchen gardens. The household depended on the kitchen garden for food and medicine. Gardeners thus had to pay attention to the plants, animals, and insects in it. Stinging nettles, I'm sorry, women needed to be able to accurately identify their, the plants and their uses. Stinging nettles are fine in a soup, but nobody wants them in a skin lotion. Similarly, destructive insects and caterpillars had to be identified and removed from plants by hand. And if anybody's ever had an infestation of cabbage loopers in their garden, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> As microclimates vary even locally, and sometimes widely from year to year, women had to continually observe their gardens. Women certainly paid close attention to the plants and insects in their gardens, as the diary of Mary Holyoke testifies. Holyoke, 
wife of Salem physician Edward Augustus Holyoke, lived within a comfortable walking distance of the Pickerings. From about 1760, on, from 1760 onward, Holyoke recorded the successes and failures in her garden over a period of almost 30 years, but such records by women are sadly few and far between. Further, women who tracked their gardens in their diaries did not necessarily do so with other readers in mind. Theirs was a practical botany. Hence, embroidery can supplement these sources of information about women's engagement with nature. Third, knowledge produced as a result of investigating nature needs to be represented somehow. Pickering presents her butterflies with the wings either in profile or spread in flight. The latter feeling is enhanced by their diagonal orientation. At the same time, the viewer is positioned directly above each butterfly, as if holding it in hand for close inspection. The artificial positioning of the butterfly helps us to identify it accurately. Botanical and entomological illustrations of the period employ similar visual tactics, presenting butterflies and other insects either flat or in profile, displaying distinctive wing shapes, colors, and markings. Both botanical illustrations and embroideries tend to present their plants as isolated specimens. And you can see that here at this strawberry plant or this um, flowering plant here, they're just plonked down. A typical botanical or entomological illustration has no, little or no illusionistic space and depicts standardized views of the plant. With its very shallow space, the white page is a kind of no place. It frees specimens from nature to take their place in the taxonomic systems, then being developed by figures such as Linnaeus. Embroidery overlaps the genre of botanical illustration in visual culture. Both share the mix of scales in a single image as a strategy, but botanical illustration tends to do this much more systematically. I'm not claiming that embroidered species are the same as botanical illustrations, only that they are related. The pictorial strategies of embroidery diverge from botanical illustration because embroideries are primarily landscapes which operate as standalone images. In contrast, Illustrations appear in a fixed sequence and function in, a, in symbiosis with their embroider, with their accompanying texts. The accuracy of Pickering's renderings, their visual features, and the widespread interest in natural science and botanizing as recreation invite us to think about embroidery in relation to these botanical or entomological illustrations. And embroiderers have used such illustrations of sources of patterns and motifs, of course. And so, for example, now I'm showing you Maria Sibylla Merriam's Noya Blumen, Blumen book, um, which contains over 100 plates of flowers. This book functioned both as botanical illustrations and as patterns for embroidery, and it's uh, reprinted many times. And we know that she originally put this together um, partly for her own use, but she was also using it as patterns for her own embroidery students. However, Pickering's butterflies embody a relationship between embroidery and illustration that goes beyond positioning embroiderers only as copyists or consumers of illustrations. The fact that she's looking at native species tell us she is not copying from books. And at this point, it's worth recalling that the Pickering orchards, one in bloom, provided plenty of food for the butterflies that Mary observed. There we go. Let's take a look then at Mary's tree over there on the left. These embroideries usually include several large trees, often identifiable as oak trees. Not every woman chose to depict fruit trees as did Mary Pickering. Women typically enlarged important objects in these embroideries, calling our attention to them, and Pickering's tree is nearly as large as, large as the house beside it. And then here, I've got to apologize, this is my uh, kind of inexpert photography. <laughs> Um, but what's important here is that we see these large yellow apples here um, in this tree that is sheltering the woman sitting beneath it. Apples, such as those stitched by her, were such a critical food source that they ranked among the very first transplants from the old world to North America, where the only pre-existing species were crab apples. Apples quickly naturalized spreading throughout New England and introducing to the existing ecosystems a new significant source of nutrients to humans and animals alike. Colonists also grew apple, pear, and other fruit trees in large numbers, sometimes by the hundreds, and households with orchards cultivated a great variety of apple types. They propagated these trees by transplanting live seedlings, by sprouting seeds, and by exchanging science for grafting. Fruit trees provide a reliable perennial crop and do not exhaust the soil as fast as does growing grain. Fruit tree, tree fruit thus supplied a valuable source of nutrients that did not require starting a new crop every year as did other plant-based foods such as grains and vegetables. 
Apples and pear trees can be quite long lived as well. And some of you may be familiar with the Endicott pear tree, which is about 375 years old by now. However, trees damaged by weather, disease or insects would need replacing and, farmer, and as farmers acquired land, new trees would need to be planted. The fruit trees pictured in these embroideries thus denote significant dimensions of family wealth as well as depicting a form of food security. Apples and pears, particularly apples, also furnished beverages such as cider and perry. Cider composed a significant part of the colonial diet. By 1790, beer and cider amounted to 85% of the annual 40 gallons of fermented beverages consumed by colonists over the age of 15. Cider can be made from pears or apples, although apples seem to be the traditional English staple. Apples could also be dried or otherwise processed to be stored for most of the winter. So, if a family had an orchard, it, would, it like the fields, was supervised by men. But in New England, the kitchen garden and the fruit trees it contained were usually the housewife's domain. Apart from running the press, which crushed apples for cider, women processed or supervised the processing of all the fruit that came from the orchard and the garden. They readied fruit for immediate consumption as well as preserving it for future needs. Apples figured prominently in women's work in the New England colonies as well as in the New England landscape. Cookbooks feature recipes for preserving apples and for making apple cakes, pies, and cider. For example, Knott's Housewife Companion of 1723 has 12 recipes for apples in the first chapter. Similarly, Hannah Woolley's cookbook, which first appeared in 1675 and is many times reprinted over the years, and I have to add also that it seems like everybody who publishes a cookbook over the next hundred years um, borrows freely from Hannah Woolley. Um, anyway, Hannah Woolley's cookbook also lists recipes utilizing apples and pears. The large number of recipes in these books for pears and apples indicate their importance in the culinary regime of the household. Yet women did not need recipes for food products they made on a regular basis. Their regular frequent processing of apples throughout the long harvest season was even greater than these cookbooks suggest. By depicting these fruits in their embroidered pictures, women articulated part of their everyday experience of the natural world. 18th century farmers had an acute awareness of the varietal range of apples. Farmers' manuals, as well as books devoted exclusively to fruit, included tables that organized planting and harvesting dates. For example, British author Batty Langley wrote a treatise which discusses in detail how to grow tree fruit, including apples. And I'm showing you now two pages from his um, uh, large treatise um, and these lovely illustrations, and I'm, uh, I've called out the golden pippin here. The book was available <clears throat> in the colony shortly after publication in 1729, indicating its value and interest to farmers such as the Pickerings, and Langley catalogs no less than 38 kinds of apples. Because he has no experience with cider apples, his list includes only apples for the table and kitchen. And I just, again, want to emphasize that women greatly enlarged their depicted apples and pears, indicating their economic and social significance to 18th century audiences. And so Mary's apple tree speaks directly to early American foodways as well as farming practice. Attending to the actual fruit that women encountered, it suggests that at least sometimes women had a specific type, maybe even variety in mind when stitching their landscapes. Women chose different colors and shapes to represent their fruits, inviting audiences to read these as referencing specific varieties, likely those grown by the embroiderer's family. And here, I just wanna call attention to the large variety of shapes um, that you see here in these apples. Um, a lot of these lumpy shapes have been bred out of modern um, apples, and this is one of the things that makes Langley's book so valuable for researchers. The variety of apples depicted by Mary is not identifiable to us now, but she almost certainly had her family's apple trees in mind when she stitched them. The Pickerings were successful farmers, carpenters, and shipbuilders, with apple orchards among the many trees and crops they grew on their extensive land holdings. Pickering's family grew many kinds of apples, and we're lucky that her brother John kept a garden notebook from 1766 to 1773, in which he noted the locations of his apple trees, when he moved seedlings, and grafts from the nursery to the field and what kind of grafts he made. For example, his garden notebook entries for 1767 show that in April, he made approximately 50 grafts on just his apple trees alone. He also experimented a little bit. An entry from 1771 shows him trying to graft a Saint-Germain pear onto an apple tree, but he doesn't say whether or not this was successful. 
In the process, John mentions more than 30 apple names, some of which can still be tracked today. The Pickering Apple Orchard held cider apples, you know, and so he calls out Golden Russetons, Red Streak, and others. Multi-use apples, such as the Golden Pippin. And it's tempting to think that Mary's brilliant yellow apples represent these um, Golden Pippins. They also raised culinary apples, such as the Cat Head and the Rhode Island apples, and dessert apples, such as the delightfully named Seek No Further. And so her father's farm journal records many sales of apples in 1741 and 1748. He calls out the Russetons, and you can just barely see that right here, but the rest are simply noted as others. His journal has entire pages devoted to the recording, the sale of apples, cider, and the use by other farmers of his mill. This indicates that the cider apples were particularly important. Pickering House in Salem still has apple trees in the backyard and the apples that I have seen, um, thanks to Linda, um, are small to average size by today's measures and round with faintly striped dark magenta skins. They resemble what are now called Baldwin apples, which are recorded as early as 1740 in Wilmington, Massachusetts, and they likely date from even earlier. Further, apples rank among the key staple foods of New England and the Pickering farm workers certainly align with this as does Mary's tree. Farm manuals and horticultural books recorded ripening dates for fruit. Likewise, detailed farm and garden calendars it listed the variety of fruit that should be ready to plant, graft, or harvest in each month. Thus, this society of landholders, farmers, and gardeners would have been well attuned to these cycles and the sequences of the fruit harvest. When women included fruit trees in their embroidered work, they registered these cycles. This audience, viewing an ornamental overmantle hanging in a parlor a few dozen yards from, from the orchard or kitchen garden which grew these fruits, would understand these apples to be more than idealized images. The embroidered apples had their counterparts on the trees outside the house. If the apples depicted resembled a variety grown by the family, then the audience for the embroideries would be able to associate the image with a specific time of year, often within a couple of weeks as well. Women's embroidered apple trees thus referred not only to important farm produce, but to life and work cycles driven by the timing of fruit harvests. These needlework trees, fruit trees, are therefore not simply stock motifs. They depict a major food source that figured prominently in the colonial diet, the ordering of social life, and the relationship between women and nature. Mary Pickering's apple tree references the intense activity ongoing in the orchards and the kitchen gardens of colonial New England. Her tree is more than a simple decorative motif. It speaks to the family farming enterprise, colonial foodways, and to women's roles in managing the household. And so now I want to turn to her blackbirds, which you see up here on the um, uh, right. Women also sometimes included motifs in their embroidered landscape that speak to the raising of pigs, rabbits, and birds, such as chickens, as well as to the larger concerns of farm life. Mary was no exception. In addition to the house and a large apple tree, Pickering's work includes a cow, several sheep, and a large rooster with accompanying hen and chicks, and you see them right here. The combination of farm animals is unusual. The sheep turn up most frequently in these works or sheep and cattle in separate groups, but you see the end of the cow right there. And this is cut off, I'm sorry, by the edge of the slide. Pickering's inclusion of the chickens along with these other animals decisively ties the image not just to contemporary husbandry, but to women's husbandry, which included the managing the chickens. The collection, or at least supervising people who manage the chickens. The collection of chickens contrasts with the group of airborne blackbirds. The chickens were a staple of farm life and the blackbirds a frequent feature of the skies over the fields. However, the juxtaposition of the two flocks does more than compare domestic and wild birds. Pickering included hunting dogs and a stag on the right, but contrary to other embroidered images of hunters, the man with the gun does not have the stag in his sights. Rather, he shoots upward at the flock of blackbirds overhead. This image is thus a less idealized or traditional one than other depictions of the stag hunt, which we see in other embroidered pictures of the time. Instead, I think it likely represents an actual ongoing intervention in the ecosystems of New England. Blackbirds represented a real threat to farmers. They regarded the birds as a pest because of the amount of grain they ate, so much so that New England towns gave farmers a bounty for bringing in dead blackbirds. 
And the town of Eastham seems to have had an ordinance that tied one such bounty to marriage. Uh, men had to produce six dead blackbirds or three crows before they could get married. And these are obviously not given to the bride. <laughs> Giving out such bounties was customary. In 1741, a Massachusetts act to prevent damage to Indian corn and other grains included a provision that voided and replaced similar pre-existing local ordinances. It provided rewards, and I'm quoting now, for every dozen blackbirds taken in their nest and not fledged, 12 pence. For the like number grown and fledged, three shillings, end quote. Such bounties provided additional incentive to kill blackbirds on site. 1741 Act was suspended in June of 1743, not because the problem was solved, but because the funds to pay the bounties had already run out. However, taking aim at blackbirds seems to have continued. Peter Kalm, the Swedish naturalist, in his travels in America, discusses the war on blackbirds at length. He relates the calamitous consequences of nearly wiping out the blackbirds in late 1740s in New England. And I'm quoting now. In the summer of the year 1749, an immense quantity of worms appeared on the meadows, which devoured the grass and did great damage. The people have abated their enmity against the maize thieves meaning the birds, for they thought they had observed that those birds lived chiefly on these worms before the maize is ripe and consequently extirpated them, or at least prevented their spreading too much. They therefore seem to be entitled, as it were, to a reward for their trouble. But after the enemies and destroyers of the worms, the maize thieves, were extirpated, the worms were at more liberty to multiply, and therefore they grew so numerous that they did more mischief now than the birds did before. In the summer of 1749, the worms left so little hay in New England that the inhabitants were forced to get hay from Pennsylvania or even Old England, end quote. So according to Calm, this plague of caterpillars caused even more damage than did the birds that usually ate them. Calm reports this incident at second hand and it's likely that it has become somewhat exaggerated in the telling. Even so, it registers both the hostile relationship between the birds and farmers and a growing awareness of the birds' usefulness. Pickering, by including the gunning down of blackbirds, tied her embroidery to specific activities that reshape the environment, perhaps even to a particular series of events. Pickering, in her side-by-side -side positioning of the blackbirds and the chickens, underscores the difference between useful and destructive birds. The embroidery suggests Mary's awareness of this regular, if to our eyes, misguided form of pest control, one encoded in and encouraged by the local law. Blackbirds also appear in the smaller landscape, um, this is circa 1757, made by Pickering's younger sister, Eunice. While other embroidered pictures sometimes include one or two blackbirds, the appearance of an entire flock seems to be unique to the needleworks of the Pickering sisters. Interestingly, Eunice included the flock of blackbirds but omitted the men with guns. Could it be that the two embroideries bracket a change in the community's understanding of the role of birds in controlling pests? Absent further documentary or embroidered evidence, we cannot tell. But the date at which the pictures were made, coupled with the change in the rendering of the Blackbird's relationship to the landscape and the two networks, uh, needleworks, at least suggests this possibility. Few embroideries present a continuous, coherent narrative of environmental transformation to the viewer. However, landscape-themed embroideries suture themselves to current events, practices, and desires, and to environmental changes through the inclusion of motifs that spoke to embroiderers and their audiences. Through their needlework imagery, women positioned themselves as interlocutors in this transformation. So in conclusion, embroidered landscapes such as Mary Pickering's engaged with the ongoing environmental transformations around the women who made them. They simultaneously elide and elucidate the delights and dangers that ongoing intervention in the environment brought as its dynamic ecosystems both responded to and shaped human behavior. To return to the butterflies that opened this talk, Jane Colden and Mary Pickering represented their knowledge of nature in different ways, using ink on paper or while on canvas. Their efforts grew in a larger field of representations of knowledge of nature. Men and women alike captured their natural knowledge in print and image, in ink, paper, canvas, and paint, and women additionally deployed silk and wool. Pickering's butterflies then, sit at the intersection of gender and the production of knowledge of nature in British North America. She has carefully observed her butterflies, but rather than recording them in a conventional scientific manner, she pictures them in thread. Just as Haywood cloaked her promotion of science to women in the guise of female piety and virtue, Pickering's butterflies appear as embroidery, a medium historically associated with female virtue. 
Mary Pickering left no other records of her knowledge of nature, yet it is unlikely that her examination of nature stopped at just three butterflies. We have seen that her or apple tree speaks to orchard practice, food security, and women's roles in processing fruit and produce. The blackbird flocks depicted by her and her younger sister hint at her knowledge of the interrelatedness of nature's creatures. Mary's embroidery is the only evidence we have of her nature interest in nature and its workings. However, I have hope I have shown that careful attention to her embroidered landscape allows her to take her place, small as it may be, in the larger history of women and their manifold nature relationships to nature. Mary Pickering's knowledge is hidden no more. Thank you. And I yeah, am. That is fantastic. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I know we're going to open this up for questions. Uh, we have something in the chat. Is that a question? Let's see. Um, oh, yes, there's lots of questions. Lots of questions. Yeah, yeah, there's a few. Yeah, so I'll just, I guess I'll just take them in order. So um, it, um, yes, she likely did all of the work on this embroidery. What you do see in um, embroideries produced by younger women is you can sometimes see um, two different hands. So the you know, teacher doing part of a motif, say like a sheep, and then the embroideress doing several more. And you can sometimes just see that she's getting better and better with each one she does. Um, and it's, I think it's unlikely that she'd seen any European tapestries. Um, uh, it's much more likely that um, she has seen uh, prints for, uh, we know that prints are coming across the Atlantic from England and from France, just, it's a fire hose. Um, so there's a lot of imagery for these sheep um, uh, uh, floating around in the culture. I think just from the way the rooster and this uh, sheep and three quarter profile are drawn that they are, those are likely lifted from a print. Um, whereas the sheep and the lambs closest to the seated woman, I think are uh, drawn by her freehand. Um, yeah, and I love I love the little sheep and the little knots that yeah. um, uh, produce that give us the woolly curly wool. Um, yes, it is framed. It's still in the original frame, um, and maybe Linda can say a little bit more about the results of the conservation. Uh, well, uh, as uh, as I mentioned, this uh, work was done by Betsy Lahikainen from the PBD Essex Museum, and she let me be in the room when she took it out of the frame. So I could also see the, the, the backing, which as you mentioned, is just remarkable uh, in, its, uh, in its, the color that remained. She, she said it was the, the best she'd ever seen yeah. uh, of, the, of that period. Um, I, I don't know about um, uh, lace to a solid backing board. I don't, I would say, in I don't her, remember that. I don't know if she put it back that way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I wasn't there when she, after the work was done. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know. I know yeah, there's a lot of tax involved, though. Yes, <laughs> she kept saving each one. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes these things are stitched to a piece of cloth that is then tacked to the frame. Sometimes they're just tacked to the frame directly. Um, stitches. These are. This is mostly uh, tent stitch, or what we think of now as petty point, um, except for obviously the French knots used in the um, wool of the sheep. Um, and then you can see, you can just barely see it here on the shepherd's belt buckle. There are a couple of, there's some metallic thread used for his belt buckle. Um, typically the 17th century embroideries have a greater variety of stitches than do the 18th century embroideries. Um, and threads are usually, well, threads are often imported. Um, and we, so we do have receipts um, that, uh, you know, indicate uh, the purchase of these at various stores. So one person, for example, who is selling this on a regular basis is Elizabeth Murray, who is a woman shopkeeper in Boston who also ha takes embroidery students. And um, um, so she is then importing the thread and then selling it to the parents of her students for their use. Um, Oh, Betty Langley. Yes, uh, I've had so much fun. That book, I have to say, is so interesting because he uh, cut the fruit in half and traced it. So 
one of the things that we see when we look at his book is that those 18th century fruits are much, much smaller than the court as a general rule than the corresponding fruits today. There's been a lot of selective breeding um, and development of new varieties between in the eight, in the 19th and 20th centuries. So for example, here in California, Luther Burbank is quite famous. He's the guy who gave us the Santa Rosa plum, for example. Hmm. Um, the Eunice Pickering textile, last time I saw it, was still hanging in Pickering House right above her older sisters. It's, it's still there. <laughs> it's, it's just there. so wonderful to be able to see the sisters work right next to each other. I, I had a question as I um, kind of see this every day, and I have always been kind of amused by, on the far right, that giant black, white, and uh, red bird sitting in the yes. tree. Yes. It, it just looks so big that oh, it, yeah. it would knock the tree down, but you, you can't see the whole thing here because it's cut off a little bit. But okay. any, any ideas about what that is? You know, it's really interesting. Sometimes you see um, um, exotic, yeah. exotic birds like parrots um, or a bird of paradise, which these women are almost certainly getting those images from the prints. Um, I'm not sure about this guy. You know, he looks a little bit like a guinea fowl, but he's too skinny, he might be a pheasant. I have not actually sat down and done the digging to determine mm. the particular type there. Um, um, uh, but yes, I, every time I look at this, I'm thinking, what is that? I've got to look at that. I've got to yeah, put, he, put he, that on the to-do list. <laughs> he's amusing, if nothing else. <laughs> he is. He's, um, um, but you know, sometimes you see these these very elaborate, you know, things are obviously parrots or macaws. Yeah. I have a question. Can you hear? Sure. Me? Yes. Yes. Can. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the design in general, and I just think it's so well balanced and well put together and thought out. Do they do they teach that, or are we just lucky to find Mary had a, a talent? I think she had a talent, but usually these big ones are kind of divided into three sections, um, typically with their own little action in each section and then it's connected by the landscape. And so actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked this because her composition's a little bit unusual. Usually the figures are all um, on, a same, on the same plane through the middle of the embroidery, but she put her shepherd and shepherdess sort of downstage front, which makes this spatially, I think a little bit more complex than some others. Um, and I think her composition, I agree with you. I think her composition is interesting because it's not perfectly divided into thirds. It's a little bit irregular, which does give it that dynamic balance. Thank you. Andrea, can I uh, ask? Sure. I was going to also comment on the composition. Um, I think it's ambitious and very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, and when young women, you know, were doing these kinds of things, it's hard for me to think of them also being able to compose, to draft the whole thing, you know, uh, and I wonder if the instructors sometimes got involved or oh, yeah. helped, you know, because it's, it's really sophisticated. It is, you know, it's interesting The women did learn to draw as part of their education. Some of them obviously took it farther than others. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Oh, Andrea, I think you froze again. Mm -hmm. Oops. Am I back? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes okay. You are now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Got a bird okay. out there squeezing his feet too tight on the telephone wire or something. Right. <laughs> oh, no. um, but I think as they learn to draw and as they are um, looking at prints and probably copying from prints, um, they are also developing a sense of composition. I do know that the instructors did contribute to that. So, for example, the um, overmantles by Eunice Warren, Sarah Warren, and an unknown woman. Um, all share the same basic composition. And so those fishing lady embroideries that come out of Boston that have that seated figure of the fishing woman are they're very similar compositional schemes, although women do vary the kinds of trees, sort of details of the composition and so forth. So, um, you know, one thing I think we can say for sure is that this was not her first embroidery. So somewhere along the line, there had to Uh oh, frozen again. Yeah. 
At least she made it through the lecture before. Yeah. <laughs> Started having yeah. trouble. There she's back. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It's 2020. What can I say? <laughs> um, one of the things is that these big embroideries are vulnerable to, like everything else, heat, light, oxygen, and time. And you can't do anything about oxygen and time. But um, they're also, because they are made of wool and silk, they're also very damage. Yeah. Um, they also became collector's items. Uh, they, they was kind of a vogue for collecting these around the centennial in the 19th century. So mm. um, some of them probably got pulled out of the attic and it's like, oh, look, this has a big moth hole in it. Well, we'll just cut it in two or cut it into three yeah. and sell the pieces with no holes. Um, yeah. So for example, Winterthur has two very small chunks that the curator there is pretty sure came from the same embroidery. Embroidered. Mm. I know <laughs> it's painful to think about when this yeah. when this was taken out of the frame we saw some little bug bits and just a small we're very lucky just a small hole or two that mm -hmm. uh, Betsy was able to fix and you'd never know it now but yeah. obviously some of them can be very badly damaged yeah. by bugs yeah yeah no this one is in really incredibly good shape and yeah. I suspect it's probably because it just has been protected in the house yeah. all these years <laughs> yep I, I have a question about the patterns. Were they sometimes imported from England? Am okay. I on mute? Oh, no, you're good. No, you're good. You. You're good. We, uh, Andrea froze again. Oh. <laughs> uh, were the patterns oh. imported from England? I think of the men's uh, waistcoats where they were uh, shipped over from England and the embroidery was done here. But uh, uh, for these, uh, were they done professionally in London and uh, then sent over so that the teachers could uh, set their students to work mm -hmm. on them? I think it's a mix there. We do have advertisements for people uh, with patterns. Local artists could also draw them. I mean, and one thing to keep in mind is that the, um, and we do have a, an embroidery teacher who advertises that she can draw patterns cheaper than the ones, than, than buying one from London. Yeah. Um, I think we need to keep in mind that women, the women who are teaching embroidery got their skills by going to these schools and by learning to draw. Um, so it's a way for a woman who needs to make a living, who had this kind of upper class education to turn her talents to use to make a living. Um, so it's, it's a mix of things. Andrea, can I follow up on that? Sure. Um, so um, as, as Dawn mentioned, and, uh, and we know that some things came, were imported from England, but um, have you found any records of these women actually owning uh, pattern books? Like, we, you know, what really strikes me is how well architecture is researched versus these women's arts. Because we, there are many, th there's been so much research on architectural pattern books that have come over and that were owned by particular architects and who copied this particular part and that particular part. But in terms of the women's work, we're nowhere near that level of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering if, if you've run across people owning the needle's eye or anything else that, you know, these, these pattern books that were published in, in, in London, I haven't seen a single reference to an, an actual woman owning an actual book. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Everybody sort of froze there for a sec. Um, I have not actually, interestingly. And I think there's a couple of reasons for this. You're right to note that women's work is not well studied, um, which is one reason I'm doing it. Um, um, but I think also women are getting these patterns from different places. So for example, I have tracked the images of the little houses that you see in some of them to, a, a, to an architectural pattern book. Um, the, I think the other thing that tends to happen is when, when women are using a pattern, one way of transferring it is destructive. So you poke holes in the lines and then put it on the canvas and you pounce it with a bag of chalk. Um, so, but I think these are, you know, with architecture, if you're building a house from a pattern book, you kind of got to really follow the instructions or the house is not going to stand. But uh, embroidery is a, is a much looser proposition and you can yeah. mix and match from different sources and you can improvise. So, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't found a, um, 
I, I would love to find a, a, a case of a woman owning one of these things. One problem, of course, is we don't know who half these women were. There's no names attached to them. Um, well, I, I noticed, for example, the stag hunt, hunt. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some master's thesis out there, I've forgotten who did it, but who tra kind of traces that motif exactly mm -hmm. back to 1630, 1623 or 31 to mm -hmm. the book, The Needle's Eye. And so that, even though that, that person in there calls it a unicorn hunt, which it's not. Um, so, so there is kind of a, a source for for that particular motif that you see in lots and lots of these embroideries. And I just wondered, you know, what the state of knowledge was on, on other things like the particular, there's a particular tulip sh shape I see all the time, if there's a particular archetype for that. Oh, have we lost her? Yeah. Oh, we might have. Um, is our speaker? Yeah. Oh yeah, she's not in the participant list. Yeah, oh, she's coming back. She's coming back. I'm back. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the guy you next door to me has to another another column here. Column. Yeah, the guy yeah. next door to me has six kids and he's homeschooling, so they may all be on the they may be slowing down my network <laughs> connection a little bit. Um uh, state of knowledge. Yeah, it's it's really sketchy. I mean, there are, you know, sometimes you can identify a specific motif like that stag hunt or that stag um, that is um, quoted over and over almost verbatim, so to speak. And so that's always a good bet that that's something that's coming from a common source somewhere. Um, other thing, and so that's why I think the that sheep that's in three-quarter profile, um, he just has that look of having been transferred from a, from a, print, especially because it's a little, it's a, it's a little warped. Um, but in other cases, I, I, this seems to be very much the women's own uh, drawing. Um, so I think this is one reason that these big embroideries have been overlooked is because you do have so many sources for these patterns. And so people have just dismissed these as they're not creative. Right? These women are not creative, they're just copying, they're just right. mindless exercises. Yeah. And I think actually the fact that those things do get repeated is indicates how important they are to those women. Um, and so this idea that there's these multiple hands that participate in the origins of these things, that really goes against our modernist idea of what an artist is. And so these women just don't get counted as artists. And so I've been, um, one of the things I've been doing is trying to approach this with this idea that you know what would happen if we took these as seriously as we take landscape paintings. It, yeah. May I comment? Sure, please. Yes. Something analogous to this that I have observed um, at a lot of antique shows are uh, are wo products made by sailors called woolies. <laughs> or pick, have you studied these, Miss Pappas? No. They are the depictions of ships in various oh. harbors and their sailing ships. And I would submit to you that the, they are accurate in terms of ship construction and rigging because these were made by sailors who sailed aboard these vessels mm -hmm. who climbed to the top mast, who unfurled the sails so they would know the exact configuration of the ship. But if you see them, they, they are usually presented against various backgrounds, usually, sometimes American ports, sometimes mm -hmm. foreign ports. And I think they were common, again, during the time when the Pickerings lived in Salem, when Salem was the wealthiest uh, mm -hmm. city in the country because of the shipping trade. And what you see in the sailors' woolies is just the observation of the sailor at that time and place. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. like the sailors were doing this in their spare time and they didn't have pattern books. They of course had the model of the ship, which was in front of their eyes, mm -hmm. obviously in their mind from their experience. But then they also had the ports and the backgrounds, which were places they in which they were. And so they were drawing this from observation. Yep you know, rather than necessarily from a, a pattern or, or, or a, a drawing book. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think that some of these women's, um, women's uh, embroideries would also be based on observation, as you mentioned with the butterflies and the mm -hmm. birds, you know, this is what she was seeing in her farm and in her backyard. backyard. 
Yeah, that's a, those willies. That's interesting. I've only seen the sort of Valentine type ones, but I will take a look. And I think you're absolutely right. There are two embroideries by Love Pickman, who also lived in Salem, that have ships that have very detailed mm. uh, ships with with that are quite you know that are quite accurate for the size of the rendering. And I'm and she probably could see those from her house. Exactly. Um, and I, I I do have in another chapter. I have a. Um, long discussion about the strawberry motifs. Some women are, I think, are, are observing these very carefully at a time when new species are... Hello? Um, so I do think they are um, observing, you know, it's a mix of stuff they're observing very closely versus things that they're just importing mm -hmm. into their things. But yeah, it's really, it's. It, I think this is one of the things that makes you so interesting. Uh, Sarah had a question about the house in the, in yeah. the piece, and I've always wondered about that. I mean, the Pickering house is not a brick house, <laughs> so I that was, that could have been perhaps a, an architectural pattern of some sort. It could have been, you, you very frequently see these, um, these sort of Georgian type houses in the embroideries. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and again, I think Love Pickman is depicting specific buildings in hers, but, um, and, and other women often are just lifting the house from an architectural mm -hmm. book. Um, okay. So it's a, yeah, I, I it would be lovely if this was a portrait, so to speak, of the Pickering house, but <laughs> she plonked that sort of generic house in there, although it does have this lovely, um, ornamentation over the door. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wonderful. And then her in her in the smaller piece above, it's the same house but with much more uh, detail about the brick. Mm -hmm. the, the the big one has is a red building mm -hmm. and the chimneys I think are brick. They are um, yeah. obviously but the, the other one, the smaller one has the whole thing as brick. Yeah. Yeah. And if you sometimes see some women seem to be very interested in the buildings. I mean, you do see sometimes little tiny flat sheets of mica, which are sewn to the canvas mm -hmm. to emulate the shiny surface of window panes. Oh, wow. um, um, sometimes the women have little tiny necklaces of real beads. Um, um, so they're they're very um, there's a kind of uh, playful quality that they have, which I just really love. I wonder if, if Catherine has anything to say since you've probably lived with these uh, in your family longer than, <laughs> than any of us. Um, anything else to, to add about them? Uh, how was it? Uh, no, you know, from my childhood, they were always treasured mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hung always in the same place, but they were always adored. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I wish I had studied them more carefully and did some needlework myself. My mother did take up um, needlepoint and loved it, um, you know, but she wasn't a real Pickering, was she? And uh, my grandmother was very adept uh, with her hands and ended up having a thriving business uh, with um, Bobesh and other uh, things that she made with uh, silk flowers mm. around the base of candles. And um, I mean, I don't think she expected that it would take off the way it did and um, turned into more of, a, more of a business than she was mm -hmm. expecting. Interesting. <laughs> but no, but, and, she, and she knitted up a storm, but mm -hmm. of course she too, she wasn't a pickering. But never mind. Um, I've always, I've always enjoyed uh, looking at the at them, and I'm so happy to hear that they've been uh, conserved by Betsy and by our our foundation supporters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Makes me feel really good about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for for explaining so much about it that I oh, never welcome. never noticed before. Yeah. This well, is an eye opener. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy. I just love these. And it's been this working on this project is probably the most fun I've ever had um, oh, as a good. scholar. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, really that conservation is so key because it's only in conservation treatment that they come off the mounts and we get a look at them. So there's lots of them that will never that they won't come up that I will never see them. They won't be seen in my lifetime. 
Uh, but they, but the bat does provide us with so much important information. Um, there's no way I would have figured out about the butterflies without a look at the it's back. The colors. Yeah. It was the, the colors. Mm -hmm. It's the colors. Yeah. Colors are really mm -hmm. important. Great. That's really, that's a wonderful information. Thank you. You're welcome. Fabulous. Um, I see two more things in the chat. Is there, let me see. Oh, did Mary Pickering attend a known day or boarding school or was she tutored in a smaller group? I have no idea. I have no idea. I would love to, um, I would love to know that. I mean, the, the overall embroidery is similar to those that are made in Boston and the embroideries that we have, they tend to be much smaller that are made in Salem tend to be work in, worked in silk. Um, so I think her teacher was probably different from some of those other younger, younger women and girls, but um, I have not yet found um, any kind of smoking gun, a bill from a teacher anywhere in the Pickering mm. papers. Although that said in California, getting there is, it's always kind of a process, but, um, and of course, was not able to do that this summer. Um, right. Right. <laughs> um, but it is one of those loose ends would be lovely to find, but for the purposes of my book, I'm more interested in this bigger picture of all of the change that uh, is happening in the environment and that humans are driving and the way that these embroideries intersect with that. There's been a lot of that kind of scholarship done on 19th century American landscape painting, but, um, um, there's just as much happening a hundred years earlier. And I don't see why these embroidered landscape pictures shouldn't be considered part of the American landscape tradition. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think it's, it says me, but I think it must be Carolyn uh, who mentions there's also a lot of symbolism behind the various flowers mm -hmm. and fruits that are included in this piece and other pieces. So that's probably a whole other lesson. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the yeah. thing is, I think that's so great about these, you start pulling one thread and there's all this stuff that comes, right? That's so yeah, there it. is, <laughs> there, yeah, so to speak, but there is that issue, you know, are these, sometimes they're, um, you know, are these all things that are associated with the fall or are these flowers associated with love? Or um, in the case of the fishing lady, I think she has a lot to do with courtship. Um, so there's, um, there, there's just a whole bunch of stuff. You know, there's some, some, somewhere someone says that there, there's some women have this motif of an oak tree with a vine that goes around it, which is supposed mm -hmm. to be, uh, in, um, some people have connected that as a symbol for friendship. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, I'm so thrilled to see so many people who are as interested in these as I am. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. And, uh, Shelby, who just left, said, uh, thank you for a very entertaining talk, as, as entertaining as it was informative, and she can't wait to get back to the house. So. And I wrap up in one sentence, the fishing lady <laughs> embroidery as <laughs> well. My take, if you want the long version, my verse, my story of the, about this is in Literature Portfolio 2015, but the uh, upshot of it is, is that that woman fishing that one of the, um, is connected to courtship in that men were very worried about women fishing for men with their beauty as bait and Ooh. keeping them on the line for too long. <laughs> um, oh, wow. <laughs> so that was really fun. <laughs> There's lots and lots of stuff in visual culture and ceramics and print culture of this man offering a woman his fish. And she's like, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I have a fish on the line. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, That's great. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Yes, Anna Marley. I know Anna. Yeah, absolutely. She's done a lot on overmantle paintings, um, and, and she's been she's been a she's an early supporter of this project. I'm very grateful to her. Super, super. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I will release you to your Sunday <laughs> day parts because we're all over the place. It's not just dinner, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Andrea. This is really a pleasure. It's great to see you again, and uh, thank you. Uh, it's so informative. I'll, and I'll, I. I'll, I different eyes now. Thank you thank for you. having me and I, I hope to get out there maybe next summer and take another closer Please. look at these now Absolutely. that I've got a lot more info under my belt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Bye.